All right, welcome back, everybody. It's another edition of the Athletic Hockey Show. Ian Mendes and Sean McAdoo with you on this episode of the podcast. In uh, the next hour or so, we'll set up Game 7 between the Tampa Bay Lightning and the New York Islanders. We'll analyze uh, what Nikita Kucherov's absence might mean for Tampa and how on earth the referees missed the cross-check that sent Cooch out of Game 6. And if that was the last ever game at the Coliseum with Anthony Beauvillier's overtime winner, is that the greatest send-off ever to an NHL arena in league history? We'll also talk about uh, Vegas and Montreal. Of course, we'll do that with Jesse Granger when he drops by for Granger Things. And we'll chat about Peter DeBoer's goalie gamble. And I'm going to make sure I tell Sean all about why it's critical, it's vital, Historically speaking, why the Montreal Canadiens close out uh, this series in Game 6. And uh, this week in hockey history, we'll look back at the NHL adopting the three-point system and John Ziegler's legacy as league president. But as we uh, uh, kick off this show, Sean, I need to bask in my own uh, glory for just a moment. Because I know you saw this on Twitter Wednesday night. Uh, we, we give you the credit for being the guy that you saw the Leafs coming the 3-1 collapse, you saw the Habs, you you saw all of it happening, the Habs hanging with Vegas. I just want to take a moment to bask in the glory of in the intermission leading into overtime last night, I joined in the Twitter game of pick your overtime winner, and I don't like playing the game of one guy per team. I'm more of just pick one guy, one team. And Sean, I tweeted out about 10 minutes before it happened, I said Anthony Beauvillier is sending this sucker to a game seven. And you nailed it, and full credit. I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of the big picture prediction guy, but I, I don't do the specifics uh, all that well. Uh, you nailed it, and yeah, I I give you credit because this isn't one of those things where you didn't pick a guy from each team. Yeah, uh, you picked one one guy, one team to win, and and you nailed it, which is the way it should be. That's pick pick one. Uh, and and live with that, and uh, you did it, and and you nailed it. I would have liked a little more detail. I mean, you could have yeah. gone into how the goal was actually going to break down, but uh, you know, for for uh, for a first uh, prediction, that was pretty good. Yeah, I should. It was Blake Coleman, right? Who who coughed up the puck? Yeah, I, I should have had. As you know, I'm just feeling Blake Coleman is setting up the winner, and. That would yeah. have just been. That would have absolutely been been there. Well, I mean, that's that's become the Islanders patented overtime play, right? Like the, the Canadians have perfected the overtime 2-1-0. Uh, but the Islanders is the, let's get the other team to pass the puck to us directly in the slot for an easy scoring chance in overtime. And it's working for them. So it's uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see which, uh, if those two teams meet in the final, who can, who can get their overtime game plan in place first. Yeah. And you know what? And it's, it's interesting because that might've been the last game Wednesday night, theoretically could have been the last game ever in the Nassau Coliseum, right? And and I think if and, – and part of the reason why I picked Beauvillier to score, Sean, is I think the greatest moment in that building's history is a Game 6 overtime moment, right? Bob Nystrom scores, wins the Cup, Game mm-hmm. 6. And I thought in my mind, I was like, you know what? I could see there's some sort of symmetry here if, in fact, the Lightning win this series. Maybe the Islanders go out with a Game 6 overtime win. But then it got me thinking too. I'm like, man, if that was if that was the last game ever in Long Island, where does that rank in terms of like arena send-offs? Because I'm having a hard time and you're so good with with hockey history. Like is it has there ever been an NHL arena send-off better than what the Islanders put ta- and of course they don't want that to be the case, but Yeah. If if this is it, th- this might be the greatest ending ever, right? And, and it does. We should say it feels like We've been saying, is this the last game at the Coliseum for like the last two months? It yeah. feels like there have been so many. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a good question. And I, I, it, it got me thinking and I, I'm struggling to come up with a really great send-off to a famous NHL building, uh, at, at least. When you look at the great buildings, I'm sure there's some. And this will be one of those things where I think people will probably reach out and say, oh, you, you know, you missed this one or what about that? But it's when you look at some of the really great NHL buildings and I'm, you know, I don't know if the Coliseum is a great building, but it's a it's it's a legendary building. Let's put it that way. Uh, a lot of them didn't didn't really have great send offs. The both the Forum and Maple Leaf Gardens went out with regular season games. 
Uh, I mean, certainly the, the last game, Maple Leaf Gardens, I remember it well. It was a February game. It wasn't a very, I think the Blackhawks came in and won 6-1 to one or something like that. Not to, not much of a send-off. Uh, Montreal, I think, was pretty similar. Thinking of other ones, the uh, the Boston Garden, I feel like, did get a playoff game, but I, I don't no. think it was an especially memorable one. You know what? Uh, te- technically speaking on the Boston Garden, yeah, they played a preseason game, Habs and Bruins, a preseason game to close out the Boston Garden, and then oh they moved goodness. to what well, I think it was called the Fleet Center originally. Yeah, but but uh, they came back to play a preseason game to say goodbye oh, to the, okay. to the All right, so that one might move to the bottom of the list. Then. Yes. You're doing you're doing preseason games. That's that's really something. Um, I, the other one that I do remember is the Chicago Stadium. That 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 amazing old building because that ended in a playoff round between the Leafs and the and the Blackhawks, and it was the Leafs who closed that building out. And it was a one nothing game too. That was uh, a, sort of a uh, anticlimactic ending for a building that when when it really got rocking was was pretty much the old uh, the loudest building out there. And uh, and the Leafs just went and played a perfect road game and didn't didn't give them any reason to get going. I was going down the list on some other ones. Like I, I think uh, the 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 odd in Buffalo. I, I don't think was a playoff game. I don't think they made the playoffs that year. Um, I seem to remember that the the Penguins' last game at the Civic Center was against Montreal. I feel like that was twenty ten. Yeah, the Halak year. That was one of Yaroslav Halak's uh, reign of terror through uh, uh, through that conference. Um, but I, I'm struggling to come up with like a really great, you know, overtime crack. Cause I mean, that not only was last night, obviously a huge game, obviously a huge goal, but just the, the scene, you know, the, the crowd yeah. going crazy, the, the big celebration, even, even tossing the, the stuff on the ice. Um, you know, it felt like, it, I mean, it felt like a whole fan base coming together saying, as you said, we don't want this to be the last game. And in fact, the next game could be game one of the Stanley cup final that they're hosting. But if it is, we're going to go out the right way, and it's it's hard not to be jealous if you're a fan of one of these other teams where you you know you saw your building just kind of end in a whimper. Yeah, and I and I think too, like regardless, either like this is going to be the greatest send off in league history. I think we've just established that as we talked it out because either that was the last game, game six in the conference final. Or it's going to be a Stanley Cup final game. Like it's mm-hmm. honestly like you're you're not going to beat that. And so it's funny when you mentioned the igloo in Pittsburgh. I I have all of a sudden I remember this. Okay, so 2010 Ottawa's playing Pittsburgh in the first round of the playoffs. Ottawa wins game one. And now I want to stress this is early in Twitter. I was just getting used to the platform. I think <laughs> I might have been a little bit more aggressive. I remember tweeting out. Uh, leading into game two in Pittsburgh. Just an FYI, we might be going in to this arena for the final time ever. Because I was like, hey, if Ottawa wins game two, they could yeah. sweep them. The Penguins fans were all over me. They're like, you... Uh, anyway, so I, I all of a sudden, when you remember the igloo being closed out, I remember uh, poking the bear or poking the yeah, penguin. It, it the is tough. The, the only good thing about finishing in, in the regular season uh, is y- you can do something with the last game. Because if it's in the playoffs, almost by definition, you don't know. You, it's either a loss and you've ended your season or it's a win and you don't know if it's the last game. Uh, so you did get, like, for example, in Montreal, the Forum, I don't remember anything about that game, but I do remember the ceremony afterwards with the passing of the torch and all the legends. And I remember the Leafs trying to rip that off a couple years later and it just not being anywhere near as good. Uh, so I guess maybe that's the side. But uh, honestly... As far as a it, the the Montreal passing the torch around was probably the greatest final image from a building that that I can remember. If this is it in New York, the beer cans all over the ice uh, and the celebration and the place going crazy maybe tops that as as far as great send offs. And we got to remember that was Pierre Turgeon who took the torch. That's a weird with the Habs. Yeah. Here's here's a great <laughs> trivia question: When the Leafs did their version of that. And started bringing out uh, former Maple Leafs. Who was the first guy introduced? So is this alphabetical? It, it wasn't alphabetical. It was almost I'm even feeling worse. Al- I'm feeling Alan Bester. 
It, I Early wish go. it was Alan Bester. It was Lou Franceschetti was what? the first guy because they started like from most recent and then went back. This was a Ken Dryden thing. Like this is Ken Dryden had seen Montreal and and the idea. Uh, and geez, this is the most Maple Leafs thing ever. The idea had been that the Canadians brought out all their legends, but that the Leafs would bring out everybody because everybody plays a role. It's not just the superstars; it's the grinders, and it's and it, it probably sounded good in a boardroom, but. In practice, you had the, you know, the Canadians, it's Rocket Richard and it's John Beliveau. And then the Leafs are like, and here's Lou Franceschetti. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's right. That's pretty much where this franchise is at. You know what? I think the Oilers closed out Rexall that way. Didn't they have like, and like, here comes Jason Bonsignor, like, or something like, I I mean, it wasn't Jason Bonsignor, (laughs) but didn't they go with some rando guys in the last, in the last game ever? Yeah, they did something similar. And the other thing with the Oilers, because that was, that was 2016, they finished with a win, which is always a great way to, to send the building home. Uh, But in hindsight, that win cost them the spot that the Leafs wound up in that ended up being the Austin Matthews spot. So geez, you think the Oilers right now with, Dracidal and McDavid. Imagine they had Austin Matthews too. If they had lost that game, they would have finished last and won the lottery. So, uh, careful what you wish for sometimes. Yeah. And by the way, last uh, last game at the the Montreal Forum. Do you know who scored the final goal in that building? I think this will make you laugh. This will make you laugh. Know. Andre Kovalenko. You, wow. you think about the greatest players that have gone through that building, and the last guy to score a goal at the Forum was <laughs> Andre Kovalenko. That's that is a but I mean the 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 Leafs can top even that because and I think some people do know this one it was against Chicago I think Bob Probert scored yeah. the last goal at the uh, at the Gardens which you know what actually given what the given some of the memories in that building that that was probably pretty appropriate yeah well hey listen again we don't know that that's going to be the last game ever in New York and they're hoping that they get another game uh, on Long Island in the Stanley Cup final I and I think, hope so too man. yeah it's, it's fun. I, I'm with you like I think if unless you're a lightning and I hope lightning fans can understand look you won the cup last year it's not that we're cheering against you in fact I find the lightning somewhat of a likable team I'll, I mean the cap issues notwithstanding I think they're a fairly likable team uh but I mean how are you not chilling for, cheering for the Islanders right unless you unless you're a diehard Rangers fan or Devils fan like sure. I get it um, but I, I, I'm thinking the Islanders' odds of, of pulling off a Game 7 win will be dramatically improved, Sean, if Nikita Kucherov can't go, right? Yeah. Like, th- this is a massive storyline here, is it not? It's it's huge. And, I mean, we don't – as we're recording this, we don't have any information. John Cooper didn't say anything after last night's game. Uh, it's, it's possible by the time people are hearing this, we may already know that he's out or we may know that he's going to be okay. Uh, we're guessing – but when a star player goes out in, on the first shift and it's the game goes to overtime and we never even see the guy again, that's not a good sign. That that this this isn't a little bruise. This wasn't a guy leaving a game and it was five one and you go, yeah, he could have come back, but we just decided to shut him down. There's clearly at least last night there was clearly something very wrong. They got two days to to figure it out and see if they can get him to play. But yeah, that that is an absolutely huge moment. This guy has been money during the playoffs. He's he's uh, you know clearly one of the very uh, very best players in the league, and you're missing him in a game where I mean, if 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 you have to go on the road against a stacked team and win a two one game. Do you want any other team other than Barry Trotz and the New York Islanders to go pull that off? And and if you're the if you're the Lightning, you're sitting there going, "We want all hands on deck because it's it's probably going to come down to one goal. So who's our guy that can score that goal? And Kucherov's one of their guys that can make that goal happen. And and it my guess is they're not going to have him uh, for for Game Seven, which is a big story and and really unfortunate because uh, the the way he went down was was not a not a play that needed to happen. No, and I think a lot of Lightning fans are like, how do you miss that, right? Like Chris, and it was Chris Lee that was the, I believe the closest official there. Scott Mayfield, he kind of reminds, Islanders fans will appreciate this. In fact, Leafs fans, you might appreciate this. Scott Mayfield gave me some Steve Webb vibes. Like, remember Steve Webb in the yeah. O2 playoffs, the building was rocking and it was like the home games, you couldn't stop Steve Webb. And Mayfield was like that last night. He was a one-man wrecking crew, scores the tying goal. But how on earth 
Sean, do the and, – and I know the re- officiating has been under the microscope, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I think when one of the best players in the game – I think Kucherov is one of the best five or six players in the game. When that guy gets taken out on a super vicious, needless, pointless, dirty hit that had really had nothing to do with anything and nothing happens in terms of a penalty on the ice, it's not good. It's not a good look for the game. I just don't know how they miss that. No, and it's not. And and the, the only thing I'll argue with you is – you keep saying they missed it. He didn't miss it. He was looking yeah, right at it. Sometimes plays get missed because they happen behind the play or, you know, you get screened out. There's There was none of that. He was looking right at the play and he just decided not to call that. And I, I look, I'm, I'm a rule books guy. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm the guy who half the time when people are mad at the refs or mad at reviews or mad at this, I show up and I go, well, actually the rule book says – I got nothing for you on this one. That's a cross check by every conceivable definition, even if you factor in kind of the unwritten rules that have evolved where if if it's in front of the net, for some reason, the rules seem to be different. If it's a board battle active with the puck right there, uh, there, there's, there seems to be a, a sort of a different standard. This was just a guy laying the lumber into somebody's arm and ribs hard enough to knock him down. Uh, and, and it's, it's not called and yeah, I, I get the frustration. It's not like, it's not like a two minute penalty makes you feel much better if you're the lightning and you just lost this guy for any period of time. But I, I don't understand how stuff like this doesn't get called, especially when it's, it's, it's one of the first shifts of the game. If it's, if there's a minute left and it's tied, if it's in overtime, we all understand that right or wrong the rule book goes out the window at this point. This is your chance as an official. You know this is going to be a physical, nasty game. We're coming off an 8 nothing game. There's there's bad blood. This is your chance to kind of establish that it, we're, we're not going to get silly here. And and he doesn't call it. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Scott Mayfield later in the game does, you know, not the same thing, but he takes some liberties with Steven Stamkos. And yeah. cuts Steven, Steven Stamkos skating off the ice with blood streaming down his face. And I'll tell you, I, at that point, I almost tweeted... Uh, you know, something along the lines of, yeah, no fan wants to see the refs decide the game. I guess instead we want to see Scott Mayfield decide the game with, with the point being that, you know, here's this low skill player running around and, and he's the guy who's allowed to have an impact. And, and then, then he, scores. he goes and scores one of the most beautiful goals. <laughs> I'm so glad shelf. I didn't tweet that. I would have had that thrown back at me so badly by Islander fans and rightfully so, because that was a beautiful goal that oh. he scored. That was, uh, I, that, I, I. I literally was watching this, and I, I know I'm a Leafs fan, so I bring everything back to the Leafs. I'm I'm going this defensive defenseman, third pairing guy who had I think two goals on the season, just scored a nicer goal than I've seen any Maple Leaf score in the last several playoff runs. It's yeah. it, it was it was just such a perfect shot. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it's it was Scott Mayfield's world, and we were all just living in it last night. And so, you know, Kucherov uh, potentially being out for a game seven is huge because this is a guy who's leading the playoffs and scoring, right? So, you know, he's out of the, uh, potentially out of the equation, but here comes Braden Point on one of the greatest heaters I think we've ever seen in our lifetime in the Stanley Cup playoffs, nine games in a row. So I'm going to give you a, a, a fictitious Con Smythe vote. And I know the series haven't wrapped up right now. If, if you're giving a Con Smythe vote right now, do you give it to Braden Point? Do you give it to Nikita Kucherov? Do you give it to Carey Price? Or do you give your vote to somebody else? Yeah, if, if I'm doing it right now, honestly, if if I'm the voting pool for the Con Smythe, I probably split my Tampa vote between Kucherov and Point, and that lets Carey Price slide in and get it. Uh, Car- Carey Price is... It's interesting. We got the latest update of Con Smythe odds earlier in the week, and I'm sure they've changed since then, but but Carey, uh, Carey Price was actually listed as a bigger favorite to win the Conn Smythe than the Canadians were to win the Stanley Cup, which implies not only that obviously if the Habs win the Cup, Carey Price is going to win the Conn Smythe. We all know that. But that they thought, the oddsmakers thought there was a, a significant chance that he could even win the Conn Smythe in a, in a losing cause, uh, which is extremely rare, but does happen. Um, yeah, Point Kucherov is, is because the thing is, Brain Point's, no one's ever done this, what he's doing right now in the last 40 years. It's, it's amazing. And yet Nikita Kucherov is still like, I think, seven, six yeah. or seven points ahead of him. Uh, you know, assuming 
he can come back and play in the final if they're even there. Uh, he's he's going to finish with a pretty pretty decent lead. Um, that's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough call for the voters, and uh, um, I think those are definitely the big three candidates. And then, of course, you get into hey, if the Islanders go, what the heck do you do there? Because that's uh, that there, there's no one player that's sticking out. That feels more like kind of an ultimate team effort sort of thing. And uh, uh, Vegas, I mean, Vegas has got a long way to go to to even get back into that conversation. But it's it's interesting. I, I like the con Smythe. It's a Fascinating award to me, as I think a lot of fans know, it's not voted on the same way as the other awards. There's not a big pool. There's there's like a dozen guys, um, there may be a few more who uh, in the media who get to pick it, and it's done at the last minute uh, at the end of the, the Stanley Cup final. So it, it can go in a lot of different ways, and you can get some interesting results. But um, yeah, if Tampa, if Tampa wins, point versus Kucherov is going to be a tough one, assuming Kucherov, hopefully, fingers crossed, can at least play in, in the final um, if that's even something we got to worry about. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool that a guy that's on a nine-game goal-scoring streak isn't just a slam dunk, lock it in, he's your cons by trophy winner. I think it it's, just speaks. It's, it's, and it's right? fun, too. Isn't it nice to finally have a playoff story? When was the last time we were talking about a guy in the playoffs going on a heater, having a, a great hot streak Feels like John Drew. And John it's Drews. not a goaltender. Right, gotcha. like it's always a goalie. Every yeah. year, there's five goalies, or you go, oh, it's the, they got the hot goalie. They got the hot goalie. Isn't it nice to have a team where yep. we go? They got the hot number one center. They got the hot goal scorer. Like it, this, it's a nice change. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's been great because it's getting to the point where it's it's almost laughable. And uh, yeah, he's he's trailing only Reggie Leach from the seventies. I there's not a lot of goal scoring or offensive records where guys from today are ahead of all the guys from the 80s and the 90s. And it's yeah. it's cool to see. It's been a fun ride. Yeah, if you think about that, Mike Bossy or Yari Curry or Gretzky in their... At, Gretzky, you know, the, Lemieux at the a- never did it. It's, at the it, apex of their career that they wouldn't have done nine straight just uh, speaks to that. You know, uh, I, I know Habs fans are probably listening to this and, and paying attention and feeling those 93 playoff vibes and, you know, waiting for the New York Islanders to take out the defending Stanley Cup champion in a game seven. Like it's all, it's all lining up, right? But mm-hmm. I got to throw this at you here of the importance, Sean, of the Habs wrapping up the series in six games. Okay. So surprise athletic hockey show trivia question for you mid show. Okay. When is the last time? A Canadian-based team won a Game 7 in the Stanley Cup playoffs at this stage of the playoffs against an American opponent. So either Stanley Cup Final or Final Four, it's a Game 7, and it's a Canadian team against an American team. I want you to try and figure out when the last time a Canadian team beat an American team in a Game 7 at this stage of the playoffs. Well, I mean, I'm I'm starting with the Leafs, and and I can go all the way back uh, to the to the. I mean, geez, the Leafs. I think you wouldn't even get until you went back to the the '80s, if not the Islanders series. So it's not the Leafs. We haven't had a Canadian team in the final since Vancouver. That was uh, Boston. They lost that game seven, of course. Um, it, it would have to have been a conference final one, unless we got to go all the way back to to the to the early nineties and the Oilers. Um, and uh, who has even been to the final Edmonton didn't do, didn't need a game seven Calgary. I don't think needed a game seven. Ottawa didn't Vancouver didn't. I like, are, are we getting back yeah, to like I'll a year that what. starts with the number one? Like, is yeah, that, I'll how tell far you what. so okay. the last time a Canadian team, beat an American team in a game seven in the third round of the playoffs or later, the Edmonton Oilers taken out the Philadelphia Flyers in game seven in 1987. Wow. Since then, there have been seven instances where a Canadian team played an American team in a game seven. Mm-hmm. Canada's 0 for 7. So here's the list, okay? Yep. Here's the list. I'll, 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 I'll do this chronologically. Uh, okay. Ottawa-Pittsburgh 2017. That's the double overtime yep. Chris Kunitz game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Boston, Vancouver, 2011. That's the four nothing. Uh, here comes the riot. Uh, yeah. Carolina, Edmonton, Stanley Cup final, 2006. Yep. Carolina wins that. Tampa Bay, Calgary, 2004, game seven. Ruslan Fedotenko, I think, scored two goals there. Mm-hmm. Ottawa, New Jersey, 2003. Jeff Friesen. Yes. Yes. 
Vancouver Rangers 1994. Nathan Lafayette hits the crossbar. We all know that. Okay, you can Tor- stop here. You can stop. Toronto, here. One, Los three. Angeles okay. 1993. Gretzky, the hat trick. And the last time a Canadian based team beat an American team at this stage of the playoffs in a game seven, Glenn Anderson, I think, had the game winning goal. Uh, yeah. Ron Hextall won the Con Smythe. Yep. Have, uh, sorry, Oilers, Flyers 87. How about that? That is that is an absolutely crazy stat. Yeah. That is, wow. Better get it done tonight, I guess, Montreal. Yeah, exactly. We're going to get back to the show in just a second. But first, you know, I think we're all kind of getting back to normal, right? Maybe we're starting to get our routines back and maybe you're, uh, you got family activities and, and you're going to be going back to work. And all of a sudden, you're going to be finding your life is going to be stressful and you're going to be thinking, you know what? I don't have time for cooking. I don't have, I just don't feel like cooking. We want to introduce you to Freshly. Freshly offers chef made, nutrient packed, delicious meals that are going to be delivered right to your door without you having to cook at all. And ordering is super, super simple. You just visit freshly.com. You're going to choose from more than 30 delicious, satisfying, better for you meals steak, peppercorn, sausage, baked penne, chicken pesto bowl. Anything that can fit your dietary needs. They got a wide range uh, to fit your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, family size, you name it. And right now, our listeners to the Athletic Hockey Show, you can try Freshly for just $6.16 per meal. Stop searching the internet for healthy food near me uh, every single night and start living life freshly. Like I said, everything delivered fresh, never frozen. You can just heat it up and enjoy it in just three months. So right now, Freshly is offering our listeners on the Athletic Hockey Show $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash NHL show. Stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash NHL show for $40 off your first two orders. Freshly.com slash NHL show for $40 off your first two orders. We'll get right back to the show in a second. But first, you know what? I have not been bothered by these late nights lately, like the 9 o'clock start times, Eastern time uh, for these Vegas games, Tampa, the Islanders going to overtime. I'm not worried if I go to bed late because I've been getting great sleeps lately. Thanks to my Helix uh, Helix mattress. Uh, this thing has been great. Uh, my wife and I have been sleeping on a Helix mattress about two months now. It's been a game changer. We got a king size bed. My wife used to complain with our old uh, queen size mattress. She used to complain that, oh my gosh, Ian, you and your restless leg, I'm waking up all the time. I can tell you in the last two months, I think she's woken up one time because of me, you know, fidgeting and whatever, you know, the restless leg. It's gone. And it's because you can't feel a thing. We got the uh, the midnight mattress. You, you go to Helix, uh, you know, go to the website, you take the quiz. We got matched with the midnight model. It was like kind of the medium firmness. We, we filled everything out. It moved everything to our preferences. I'm telling you, this thing is fantastic. My wife even sleeps with one of those smart watches. Gives her like a sleep score above 90 uh, every time. And she's getting great sleeps. I'm getting great sleeps. This thing got delivered to our door. We unboxed it. And, and people who know me, listen to this podcast, you know, uh, Ian is not a handy guy. He doesn't know how to set things up. I'm telling you, we got the frame, we got the mattress, my 13-year-old daughter and I, we just watched the unboxing video on the internet. We had this thing set up in like 10 minutes. It's great. Don't take my word for it. Uh, Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick in 2020 by both GQ and Wired Magazine. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to helixsleep.com slash uh, slash NHL show. You're going to take that two minute quiz I was telling you about. They'll customize a mattress for you. Uh, they got a 10 year warranty on these things, and you can try it out for a hundred nights risk free. They'll even pick it up from your house if you don't love it. But like I said, okay, like I said, you're going to love this thing. And right now, for listeners of the Athletic Hockey Show, Helix is offering up to $200 off of all mattress orders. And they're going to toss in two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash NHL show. That's helixsleep.com slash NHL show for up to $200 off and two free pillows. All 
All right, Sean, and listen, speaking of the Habs and Vegas and Game 6 and you know possibly a Game 7, let's uh, bring in the guy that covers the Vegas Golden Knights for us with The Athletic. It is a little segment we like to call Granger Things, brought to you by our friends at BetMGM, the exclusive betting partner with us at The Athletic. Here we go. Jesse Granger, everybody wants to know, as we move into Game 6 Thursday night, what is your gut telling you on who takes the starters end this evening the Vegas Golden Knights in Game 6. Yeah, we should know here in about an hour, whoever leaves the ice first. Uh, but my gut's telling me Robin Leonard. Um, my gut hasn't been right <laughs> in, st- in terms of the starting goalie because I'm not sure what Pete DeBoer is doing. I thought he probably should have stayed with Flurry after that gaffe in Game 3. He didn't. He went with Robin Leonard and ended up being the right decision because Robin Leonard was excellent. So then I thought, well, of course, Robin Leonard is going to get another game. And he didn't. He went back to Flurry. Um, and I and and to be honest, I didn't think it mattered. I thought Flurry was outstanding in Game Five, um, and it didn't matter who was in net. The Golden Knights were going to lose that game regardless. So so far, the goalies have both been pretty good. I don't. I'll be. I'll say this. I don't think the goalie will determine who wins the game tonight. I think whoever plays Robin Leonard or Mark Andre Flurry are going to be good enough to win. It's going to be up to the rest of the team, which hasn't been good enough. Has Has there been any explanation as to? The switch, like we we saw earlier in the playoffs, them go to Robin Leonard in a game one, and and that was a that was a fatigue situation. It was a load management on Mark Andre Fleury more than anything. Uh, w- was this was this something like that again? Was this a case where them saying we we got to get Leonard in at least one game in the series, and this feels like the right time? Was it a performance thing where they we we all saw the giveaway in, in game three? Uh, was it was it in between? Do they have they given us any indication, or is this just one, another one of those things where fans are supposed to guess? We asked Pete DeBoer after uh, Game Four when he played Robin Leonard, and he said it had a lot to do with Flurry's fatigue. He, it was he went with the load management reasoning. Um, he even brought up the stat. You, you could tell he was prepared for the questions. He goes, Mark Andre Fleury was tied for uh, most starts in the playoffs for any goalie with Andre Vasilevsky, and he's 10 years older than Vasilevsky, which is true. Um, I don't know if I buy the load management quite as much just because I think the load management did play a factor. But at the same time, if Mark Andre Fleury, if that puck doesn't go off his skate in game three and into the front of the net and they win that game 2-1, Flurry was really good in that game prior to that play. He probably is one of the three stars of that game. They had just they would have just won that game to go up 2-1 in the series. I highly doubt they're switching to Robin Leonard in that situation. But I think a combination of Flurry might have been looking a little tired. They've got a great backup goalie in Robin Leonard. And I think that mistake, while Pete DeBoer said it played no factor in the decision, I think it probably maybe if not, maybe that if that if not that mistake, at least losing that game did play a factor, I think. Yeah, but you know what? You you kind of touch on this, and I think maybe the the goaltending is a red herring here. Like we're all focused on, oh man, is it Flurry? Is it Letter? And meanwhile, it's like, hey, the big guns for the Vegas Golden Knights have gone MIA. So, like, is it something specifically like Phil Deneau and those guys are doing? Is it just something else? Like, like what is the reason why Jesse? Mark Stone, I know Patrick scored last game, but like the guys that you would count on to put the puck in the net for Vegas have disappeared here in, in in this series. Yeah, they definitely have. Um, I was joking the other day. I don't know if Pete DeBoer might just be flipping these goalies just to take the pressure off of his top forwards. Seems like that's n- nobody's talking about Mark Stone's disappearance. Everybody's talking about who's in net when both goalies are playing fantastic. So for them, it's like, put all the attention on those guys. I'm fine with it. You're right. It's the second year in a row that the Golden Knights have gotten to the third round of the playoffs and Mark Stone and that line has disappeared. Um, It's a little concerning. You, you mentioned Philip Deneau and obviously he plays a huge role Um, after what he's done in the first two rounds. I think it'd be crazy to not give him credit for, for being out there most of the time when Mark Stone is struggling. It seems to me like Vegas, it's a combination of Montreal has a really good neutral zone defense. They, they, pack their five guys in the neutral zone and make it tough to get through. And they deserve credit for that. But I also think it's a combination of that and Vegas just not executing because you need that one pass in the neutral zone, right? When a team's playing that well, you need that one pass in the neutral zone. And if it's accurate and on time, you can tear through that defense. And especially in game five in Vegas, I thought 
their passing was just so off. And that's Montreal, to Montreal's credit, they're disrupting that timing. They're making them thread that perfect needle pass, but they're just not making it. And when they don't make that pass, they're, they refuse to dump it in. They're trying to make the pass every time. They're trying to make that perfect pass. And when you do that, you turn the puck over and Montreal, they kind of just sit back and wait and wait and wait. And they're super patient. And to me, when I watch this series, what's kind of been the storyline in my head is Montreal's star players don't aren't scoring that much either. Um, Deneau ha- does not have a goal in the playoffs. He has two assists, but it doesn't frustrate him because he knows I don't need to score. So when Mark Stone and Philip Deneau are battling each other back and forth and Mark Stone has shut Philip Deneau down just as well. But the problem is Philip Deneau does not care. He's not frustrated at all. The Canadians aren't frustrated as a team. They will sit back and sit back and be conservative and wait for that chance. And then they get a breakaway and they score. Whereas the Golden Knights, when they're getting shut down, it does frustrate them because they feel like they should be producing those players. So I think it's been a game of patience and Montreal has been a lot more patient. And I think a lot of that has to do with the expectations on each team. So here, here's a question for you. And I think Sean has kind of alluded to this in some of his articles in the last couple of weeks. You know, the Vegas Golden Knights have done a pretty good job of going big game hunting in the last few years, right? They get Pacioretty, they get Stone, they get Petrangelo. Uh, I'm going to throw a fictitious scenario at you. Vegas loses game six on Thursday night. The offense is rather silent. Does Bill Foley uh, and the ownership group and then the general manager, uh, you know, Kelly McCrimmon, George McPhee, the, the, the hockey operations staff, do they get aggressive and say, you know what? We need Jack Eichel. Damn it. We need Jack Eichel. And that's how we're going to fix this thing. Is there any is there any way that they just continue this pro- uh, aggressive push of just acquiring star players? Yeah. So the logical side of me says the team with absolutely no cap space that had to play a beer league roster with two lines half the games this year is not going to add a multi million dollar Jack Eichel at center. But everything over the past four years covering this team tells me that there's a chance. I we mean, we would have you said the same thing about Alex Pietrangelo, wouldn't we? Right. Exactly. exactly and you, you guys mentioned Patch Reddy and Stone and Petrangelo, but it's also like they went after Eric Carlson. They tried to get him from Ottawa before he ended up in San Jose. They were in John, they were in on John Tavares. They didn't end up getting him. He was destined for Toronto. He didn't really even give Vegas a thought, but they wanted him. I mean, they've been on literally every big fish in the NHL, whether it's free agency or trade, basically since they've been in the league. And you add in the fact that you look at the Golden Knights roster and is as talented as it is, the biggest weakness, the biggest glaring missing piece on this team is a number one center. And obviously, Jack Eichel would fill that. Now, you'd have to dismantle what they have right now in order to, to make Jack Eichel fit. Like The team is going to look drastically different. That's probably two or three players being moved out. And I think for a team that they they already don't have enough cap space to fill out the roster the way they'd like like not just in numbers in terms of talent like the they have to play a lot of minimum salary guys because of how top heavy the the salary cap structure is on their lineup and i think adding a guy like jack eichel makes it even worse so i i don't see a way that they make it work with still being able to put together a legit nhl like bottom 6 roster I'll, I'll I'll just say it only because I know people are thinking it as they listen. Vegas goes out, they trade for Jack Eichel. We know he's got the problem with his neck. They say to him, you know what, Jack? Take your time. Have the surgery. Do lots of rehab. And you know what? We'll see you in April when the regular season's over. And as we all know, there's no more salary cap. Then you and your, your $10.5 million cap hit come on back and be ready for game one. I'm just, just going to put it out there. <laughs> just to fuel that storyline a little more. I, the other day, I was looking at what's going to happen to this division. And if there were a division, a team and a division where adding a player and not needing him for the regular season were a scenario. I mean, this division wasn't great this year in the West, right? Like it was Colorado, Minnesota and Vegas and St. Louis struggled. And, and then the rest of the division was really, really bad. And next year, Colorado, Minnesota and St. Louis are all out. The only other three good teams other than Vegas, they're all out. They're replaced by Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver, Mm -hmm. all who struggled. And then Arizona's out, and they're replaced by Seattle. So it's going to be Vegas, (laughs) 
with and that's the only that, other good team. Because I've been assured that when you're an expansion team, it's all rigged so that you're going to be a contender, yeah, right? So right. Seattle is going to be amazing, but the rest Superstars, of the yeah. right? But it's it's literally Seattle, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Anaheim, L.A., San Jose. Like, there's not a lot in that division. If you could make it without Jack Eichel, like. You're in good shape. <laughs> Just putting it out oh, in the world. Boy. Hey, listen, Jesse, as, uh, as we wrap up our segment with you, we always have you, like uh, we say, for uh, Bet MGM, and we uh, pick a line or two earlier in the podcast. Sean and I were talking about Conn Smythe Trophy uh, candidates, and, and the obvious ones are Carey Price, Braden Point, Nikita Kucherov. But maybe you can walk us through, where to, maybe you could put some smart money down on a dark horse candidate outside of those top three guys. Right. I think right now is a good time that if you're wanting to bet on Conn Smythe, because once in two days, the, the finals could be set. And once that's set, the odds decrease drastically, right? Because now it's two teams, you're getting one of them. Whereas right now, if you can pick a team, if you can pick New, a guy on New York, you're getting way better odds than if they win in game seven. So um, speaking of the Islanders, I looked at theirs and it shocked me that Semyon Verlamov is their favorite to win it right now. Um, the guy's seven and six. He's been good, but he's seven and six. He's Ilya Sorokin's four and one and has better stats in basically every category possible. I would shy away from him and I'd look at other guys and and that's where you can find some value. I think so. So Barzal obviously leads the team in points, but a guy like Anthony Bavillier is one point behind Barzal. He has the same amount of assists and one fewer goal, and his analytics are very good. And he's 50 to 1 right now. Um, hmm. I think a guy like that, especially on a team like the Islanders, where the scoring is so spread out, you get into it, you, you got you get a guy like that at 50 to 1. He's one goal behind Barzal. He has three goals in the final. Suddenly you've got the leading scorer on the team at 50. 50- 50 to 1 to win the Con Smart. I think that'd be phenomenal value. Um, another team. You guys mentioned Montreal. Carey Price is the overwhelming favorite at plus 275, and no one else is even close. The next closest is Tyler Toffoli at 30 to 1, plus 3,000. Um, I think if I was betting, I mean, you got a team that has two chances to, to get a win to go to the cup final. You can get Tyler Toffoli at 30 to 1. If you want to get crazy, Philip Deneau has two points. I think he might be the best, have the best chance of winning a Conn Smythe, a guy with two points in the history of hockey. He is not on the board at some places, but if you can convince him to get him on the board, I have seen him at a hundred to one. So, I mean, yes, it's kind of crazy. He's got two assists and two points in the playoffs, but at the same time, the the storyline around this team has 100% been Philip Deneau's ability to shut opposing lines down. And you tell me that the Montreal Canadiens play Tampa in the final and he shuts down Nikita Kucherov and scores one goal. All he needs is one. You've got a guy at 100 to one to win to win a Conn Smythe. I think there are. And like and like I mentioned, Tyler Toffoli at 30 to one. He leads the team in points. I think that's another good one. Um, Carey Price is obviously the favorite, but there are scenarios where. Montreal plays Tampa and and Tampa scores some goals and and the Canadians need offense and they end up you end up getting a goal scorer um, to win that award. So I think that there those are some guys that at this stage with four teams still available you can find some value and not just those guys. I advise anyone who's going to bet Con Smythe now is the time. If you're if pick your pick your person and and I think it's worth it to take the risk while there's still four teams. The odds right now are better than if you wait two days until you have your cup final matchup set. And and worth pointing out that the Conn Smythe is technically an award for the entire playoffs, but realistically, the recency bias kicks in big time in the final. So if you're looking yep. at somebody and you're going, well, you know, the, their numbers so far, especially the skaters, the goalies, it's, it's maybe a little more uh, the full body of work, but especially yeah. the skaters, if you're going, uh, numbers aren't that great, couple of big goals in the final moves you right up the list real quick all right well listen jesse uh we look forward to your coverage of game six potentially a game seven in that uh, conference final between uh, montreal and vegas we'll get you again next week to set up the stanley cup final and we'll see if it's uh, a vegas or montreal that's in there but we appreciate the time have a great week and we'll get you again next thursday awesome thanks for having me guys all right, always fun to get to Jesse Granger uh, in with the Granger things, especially when the team he covers is uh, front and center, as they will be uh, on Thursday. Sean, uh, Vegas and Montreal, they don't have a lot of history there. There's not a lot of rivalry, but I thought it was really interesting, and it was Chris Cuthbert who tweeted out a photo before the game, Vegas and Montreal in uh, game five, of the scoreboard at the T-Mobile Arena in Vegas of... Celine Dion, who is one of the most iconic 
uh, figures in Canada and certainly one of the most iconic uh, figures in Quebec. Uh, she has been known to cheer for the Montreal Canadiens in the past. And yet here are the Vegas Golden Knights pushing Celine Dion, who is, we should point out, right? She lives in Vegas. Like that's kind of her, her, her home now. Like, I'm going to use pun intended here, uh, jumping ship with her Titanic reference. But (laughs) like, do like, Mm -hmm. is there something here? Like, is this a controversy? Like, should we be worried that or bothered by Celine Dion, pimp, like, like cheering for the Vegas Golden Knights over the Montreal Canadiens? I, I, I hate to break this to everybody, but it's, it's, it's better that you hear it from a friend. That celebrity that you think cheers for your favorite sports team doesn't really care about your favorite sport. <laughs> there are like five celebrities that are real honest to God fans and everybody else is just, they put on a cap or a shirt, you know, when this, when, when the singer comes to town and they come out in your favorite team's Jersey, like that's not, I promise you Rihanna isn't really a diehard what? Senators fan as, as much yeah. as, as the Ottawa fan base loves that. Uh, you know, you, you go on down the list and just because you can find a photo of somebody now, you know, Celine Dion, obviously that's maybe a little bit different, but uh, typically speaking, big time celebrities are busy with big time celebrity stuff and they're not real diehard fans. If I, if I saw Bill Murray walking around in a Yankees cap, I'd be upset. <laughs> that would bother me. But beyond that, I mean, there's, uh, it, there's, uh, it, it happens it happens all the time. I'm trying to think of other examples. Like, do you remember LeBron? Oh, the whole thing that with was, the Yankees. Wasn't that with the Yankees? Thing? He yeah. had the Yankees cap, and then they were playing the they Cleveland. Were playing yeah. Cleveland, right? That was when he was still, uh, and that was a whole thing. And and there's a handful of others, but um, I promise you, man, your 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 favorite celebrity that you think is is a real diehard for your team. Uh, they probably don't care. Every celebrity should just do the Rob Lowe thing with it. Remember, he had the hat NFL with logo. The NFL yeah. <laughs> logo, and people were making fun of that. Like, who yeah. has an NFL hat? Celebrities do. That's that's what they should all be. That was the only honest celebrity in the stands moment that. Uh, that we oh had. yeah, like even Matthew Perry uh, of Friends fame used to be an Ottawa Senators fan. At least publicly, kind of grew up in Ottawa. I haven't seen that guy tweet or say anything about the Ottawa Senators. In years. No, it's, and it's, you know what? It's, it's fun too, because there's some celebrities who've been able to pull it off where there's multiple fan bases that just think that they're like Michael J. Fox. There's Canucks yeah. fans who are convinced that he's like a diehard Canucks fan. LA he's, Kings? I think. A oh, Bruins no, Bruins. Guy. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I you're right. You're right. In LA, yeah. I mean, everybody you're in right. LA is all the celebrities, but I think he was a Bruins guy. So he went awfully quiet in 2011, I think. He, he knew what, <laughs> uh, he, he at least, Give him credit. He was smart enough not to let the Bruins put him up on the scoreboard and uh, and uh, and suddenly turn that turn that thing around. But yeah, I I feel like probably whoever wins. I don't feel like Celine Dion sitting in her den like kicking over the coffee table because her favorite team didn't win. <laughs> we'll get right back to the show in a second, but first today, many small business owners are busier than ever because they're focused on managing and growing their business. They can't always spend the time they wish they could on recruiting. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has made it easier to find and hire the best candidates for free. Get started by posting your job for free to reach LinkedIn's network of 740 million professionals. Fill out targeted screening questions to get your role in front of the most qualified candidates with the experience, skills, and motivation you need. Then use simple tools to filter and prioritize the top candidates you'd like to interview. LinkedIn Jobs will help you hire the right person for your role and... Your first job post is free. Just visit linkedin.com slash NHL show. Again, that's linkedin.com slash NHL show to post your first job for free. Terms and conditions apply. If dreams of vacations and enjoying the fun of life are turning back into a reality for you, don't let concerns over financial setbacks keep you from saying yes. Credit Karma helps keep your financial goals in check so you won't have to hit pause on a good time ahead. Credit Karma's game-changing technology shows you tailored offers for credit cards and personal loans that you're more likely to be approved for so you can apply with more confidence. They use your credit and other financial information to show you custom recommendations. Whether you want cash back, travel rewards, or to consolidate debt, Credit Karma can help you find the offers that fit your goals. With a selection of options and approval odds, you have the power to make informed decisions. Credit Karma. Apply with confidence. 
Go to creditkarma.com slash podcast to learn more and find offers tailored just for you. That's creditkarma.com slash podcast, or you can see your offers on the Credit Karma app. Apply with confidence today. Go to creditkarma.com slash podcast or the Credit Karma app. All right, as we always do, let's wrap up with a little uh, This Week in Hockey History. Got a, a couple of things to hit on. Uh, let's go back to uh, June of 1998. Okay, so we go back to uh, June 22nd, 1998, Sean. And, and this one to me is really interesting because the NHL decides that they're going to adopt the three point formula, meaning uh, if the game is tied after 60 minutes, it will be uh, one point for each team with a bonus point handed out, a bonus point handed out for the overtime winner. And then they also announced at this time that the overtime format would go to four on four, which I know sounds really silly because now we've got three on three. But, I mean, how are we feeling about this? Again, we go back. Uh, the date that, uh, you know, that that probably a lot of fans should – have circled because this to me really changed a lot of the way the game was made. And I apologize. It's June 21st, yeah. 1999 three point yeah. system. And gets you're, adopted. And, you know, you're saying three point system bonus point. It's the loser point. That's yeah. what we're talking about here. It's the loser point. So I'm going to shock you right now. What? Because I have, I know a lot of fans don't like the loser point. I'm right there with you. I, I, if there are, if there's anyone in the media who has written and talked more about how much they hate the loser point than, than me, I'd like to see it because I've beaten this into the ground for years and years and years. Ah, so but I'll, I sense I'll, a, a butt a but is there coming There is a butt coming. Here's the butt. When it was brought in in 99, it wasn't awful. And I'll tell you why. There was a reason that they brought it in. A lot of people maybe weren't, weren't around back then, weren't fans – so let's talk about the history here. The, the, this was actually a case of the NHL, I guess to their credit, doing something they almost never do, which is recognize a problem and get creative on a solution. The problem was back then, late 90s, the dead puck era has now set in. We're into the, the scoring rates have plummeted. It's become a clutch and grab league. It's everyone's doing the trap. Games are all three to two if you're lucky. Uh, defensive mindset has has locked in. And what ended up happening was overtime became a very boring part of the game. It was, it was first of all, it was five on five, so there's, there wasn't a lot of room on the ice. But just the philosophy, overtime used to be fun. It used to be your last chance to go out and get a win. You'd send your best guys out there and try to score. But the mindset in the NHL had become, hey, man, we've just grinded our way through 60 minutes. We're tied one to one. Let's not go out there and blow it and give up a goal, and then we walk out of here with a loss and no points. Uh, and so overtime, the the rates of games that were decided in overtime, the ones that went to overtime, had plunged. I think it was at some point it was like 20%. So there was an 80% chance that you sat down for overtime. You weren't going to see anything. And it wasn't just that there were too many ties, although that was part of it. It was overtime itself was just super dull. I mean, you flipped on a game and you saw it was overtime. You were like, oh, man, I already missed all the good stuff because this is just going to be two teams – sending the puck in deep and killing time. So the NHL said, you know what? We're going to completely change the incentives. We're going to say, you get a point. You lose an overtime, you still get a point. Now, go play for the win. And there were still ties back then. So if you wanted to sit back and play for the tie, you could, but you didn't gain anything at this point. You already had the point. You were going to get a point for a tie. Might as well go for it. Might as well open it up. And that combined with four on four suddenly turned overtime into this pretty exciting thing. Now, the obvious side effect of that was immediately more games started going into overtime because coaches aren't dumb. They go, well, you're going to give me a point. If I get to overtime, we're going to play for overtime. Um, but as a way to discourage teams from playing for the tie, it was actually a pretty smart thing to do. Now, fast forward five years after that, and we come out of the lockout, and now we have the shootout. There's no more ties. The reason for having this stupid thing in the first place is now gone. We don't need it anymore. But by that point, all the GMs in the league are so used to having these inflated records. They're going, whoa, you're not taking our points away now. And we're still stuck with the thing. So the loser point is terrible and stupid and awful, and it should be gone. And it should have never been in the league once we brought shootouts in. 
But during that five-year window, before we had shootouts and we were just trying to get overtime to be exciting and get teams to stop playing for ties, it actually wasn't terrible. So the other one I want to bring up here this week in hockey history, June 22nd, 1977. And that is the NHL names John Ziegler as their president. And and really, he was the last president before they kind of made this into a commissioner's position. I know there was like Gil Stein and yeah. stuff. But, like you know, John Ziegler was on the job for, for, for quite a while. And I want to know, if you look back and say, okay, John Ziegler, what's his legacy? Like, for me – this is just my my thought on John Ziegler. I think it's merging with the WHA, right? Like he he yep. brings the WHA into the fold, brings the four teams over, you know, Hartford, Quebec, Winnipeg, and, and Edmonton, and kind of brings or ends the the threat of the WHA. That's what I think it is with John Ziegler. But maybe you know what? When I ask you, what do you think John Ziegler's biggest legacy is? What uh, what's your answer? There's there's sort of two. Two versions of this, right? There's what's his biggest legacy as far as the impact that's still felt today. And then there's what do you remember most about John Ziegler? And uh, yeah, his biggest legacy, I would agree with you, is the WHA merger. He he takes the job in 1977. It's controversial at the time. He's, he's American. He's a lawyer. He's a guy without a, a lifetime of hockey background. He had worked in, in hockey and worked with the league quite a bit. He wasn't some outsider, but this wasn't you know, Frank Calder or Clarence Campbell or somebody like that, which is what the league was used to having, these hockey lifers. John Ziegler comes in and, and a big part of the reason why he was given the job is even at that point in 77, it was known that the WHA wasn't long for the world. Something was going to happen. Was it going to be a merger? Was it going to be a takeover? How was this going to shake out? And it was a very complicated situation. And And he did manage to Stick handled the league through that reasonably successfully. I mean, the, the four teams he brought in are all still in the league to this day, not in their original locations in, in all cases, but but he actually did that reasonably successfully. Uh, he was also uh, the, the, the guy responsible from a leadership perspective for the early 90s expansion. So Tampa, Ottawa, Florida, Anaheim, San Jose coming in in that, that kind of weird merger with the, with the North Stars. Um, he had that as well. We we had a decade with uh, pretty much a decade almost with no franchise moves or, or financial problems. That was big. He also, um, this is kind of forgotten now, but in the 1980s, the NHL, like like all the sports leagues, had a uh, issue with the player drug use where there was this was a new situation. They never We'd never cared what players did on their own time before, but now you had uh, this situation breaking out. He had to sort of guide the league through that. So he had a lot of things on his plate. And I, I think you could make a, an argument that he was reasonably successful at most of them. So that is probably what his legacy should be. What do people remember? We all remember 1988, the, uh, the, the devils and Bruins have yeah. another donut yellow Sunday with the referees coming out in their range raincoats. And this whole time, John Ziegler is MIA. Nobody knows where the president of the NHL is. I mean, imagine Imagine something crazy happening tonight with Montreal and Vegas and there's, you know, officials are walking off the job, games are being delayed. It's just absolute madness and nobody knows where Gary Bettman is and nobody can reach Gary Bettman. Uh, you know, that that was the whole thing. Why we ended up with the with the the officials in raincoats was because they the, uh, the Devils wanted to appeal the suspension and they had to appeal it to John Ziegler and John Ziegler wasn't around. Nobody knew where he was. And, and so they ended up going to court and it was this whole whole mess. And I believe to this day, we've never known officially uh, what it what it actually where John Ziegler was and what he was doing during that time. It, it, it seems incomprehensible. I mean, imagine today if Gary Bettman went missing, somebody would be <laughs> tweeting out a photo of him, you know, within 24 hours and uh, we'd have our leads. Back then, it was just kind of like, well, the president of the league isn't around and I guess we'll just have to muddle through and figure it out with whoever's whoever's left. One of the very strangest stories in the history of the NHL. And to this day, the, the, the first thing that pops into my mind whenever I hear John Ziegler's name. All right. Uh, one other one here, real quick. June 24th, 1980, this week in hockey history, the NHL announces, Sean, the Flames are relocating. They're moving from Atlanta to Calgary. And I'm always fascinated by this in sports history when a franchise relocates, but they hang on to the same name. Everyone, the, the one that everyone thinks about is the Utah Jazz, right? Like yeah. they come from New Orleans, they move to Salt Lake City where there's really 
no connection to jazz and that type of vibe, and yet they're the Utah Jazz. It makes no sense. Like, why did the Flames hang on to the the, the moniker Flames when they moved? And how many how often does this happen in NHL relocation where a team moves but keeps the name? Yeah, well, I'll answer that question first. Uh, never, other than this time. This is the only time in NHL history that a team has moved, and there have been a fair number of franchise moves in NHL history, and, and kept the name. Even if you go back to the pre-original six days when uh, there were teams kind of moving all around, they would they would change names whenever they moved. This is the only time. And I, I, the answer, I had to look it up, is that the Flames owner just liked the name. That was it. He figured it was... You know, Calgary was was an oil town, and he figured that the flame kind of kind of fit with that. Um, obviously, you, you couldn't directly reference uh, oil because you had the Oilers already uh, established. So uh, that that's the answer. Is you know back then teams didn't you know there weren't these big consulting teams coming in and uh, you know spending millions of dollars and pitching and making slide decks and all this stuff. Back then, a lot of times the name just came down to what the owner liked. The owner of the Flames liked that name and decided to keep it. And uh, uh, that history was made because it's the only time and and probably the only time we ever will be that uh, an NHL team keeps its name. So, yeah, we we don't have our version of the Utah Jazz. We don't have our version of the Lakers uh, moving to Los Angeles. (laughs) You're looking around going, where's the lake? Uh, That's uh, other sports have had that, but not. Uh, not the NHL with this one exception. Yeah, the Dodgers uh, moving from Brooklyn to uh, to Los mm-hmm. Angeles. But uh, do, do the Stars get a half mark moving from Minnesota to Dallas? They drop the North, but they keep the Stars. They drop the North, and and that one probably is a half mark because the Minnesota North Stars had not officially, but kind of unofficially even dropped the North in their last season. They they had started referring to themselves as the Stars uh and uh, and so maybe that is is almost uh, almost an equivalent, but yeah, Dallas, uh, which in a way is was maybe even uh, maybe even worse uh, to, to to just drop the drop the description but keep the keep half the name in there. Uh, that was a little tough for those Minnesota fans. All right, we'll leave it there, Sean. Uh, listen, as always, this was a ton of fun. Uh, the hour just flew by. Uh, have a great week, and I guess when we uh, reconnect for next week's show, we'll be setting up uh, uh, the Stanley Cup final. Sounds good. All right. And a reminder, uh, everybody, that uh, we, we're five days a week now with the Athletic Hockey Show. We got that uh, prospect series with Max Boltman, Corey Promen coming your way on Friday. If you didn't hear the Wednesday edition of the Athletic Hockey Show, that's the two-man advantage version with Burnside and LeBron. They have the uh, current Jack Adams award winner, Rod Brindamore, on the show. So make sure you get a chance uh, to listen to that. And uh, a big thanks again for joining us. If you got any questions or comments, drop us an email, the Athletic Hockey Show gmail.com and if you're not a subscriber with the athletic uh, you can join us at the athletic.com slash hockey show and you'll get a subscription for just $3.99 a month this episode of the athletic hockey show was brought to you by betmgm sign up today with betmgm the exclusive betting partner of the athletic and get a $1,000 risk-free first bet plus get a free three-month subscription to the athletic just sign up at betmgm.com slash NHL show to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. That's betmgm.com slash NHL show. New customer offer paid in bonus dollars. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada.